Hello and welcome to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and today we're going to talk about Pure Land Buddhism and we have with us two leading practitioners, Caroline and David Brazier. And between you, you've had, welcome first of all. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. You have between you written 12 books, which is very impressive. I have a couple here, a couple of the ones that uh, apparently sell quite well. Um, and I think you've also been translated into 11 languages, so we feel quite honoured to have you here. I mean, it's pr <laughs> prolific authors. But let's start with how you got into Buddhism, and then we'll look at Buddhism itself and Pure Land Buddhism, and uh, you also live in a community. We'll look at all those areas. But just start us off by what, first of all, attracted both of you, you to uh, follow Buddhism, find Buddhism. I was a spiritual child I guess I had experiences as a child which looking back on it I would call spiritual experiences uh, I, they, they made no particular sense in the context I was living in um, so I suppose I was on a kind of spiritual quest all of my childhood and adolescence when I started reading Buddhist materials and then in due course encountering Buddhist teachers, I recognized something there. It felt like a homecoming, and that's how I got into it. Uh, it's a long well, story well, since then, too, because, you know, that was more than 40 years ago that sort of I first got into Buddhism. Was there specific experiences you had as a child or as a teenager that you couldn't quite understand, which your reading of Buddhism helped you to clarify? Yeah, I, I had uh, what I suppose you would call visions of a transformed world. And I lived with in a family of, of people who were basically agnostic and rather sceptical about anything spiritual. I grasped, I suppose, at what was to hand, which, which then was, was uh, Christianity, which was available in school and that sort of thing. Um, and I think my parents were rather astonished to find that they had this um, pious child in their midst. My mother always remembered sending me out for my 11-plus um, exam, as it was in those days, and, and she said, my dear, you don't look worried. And I said, well, why should I be worried, Mother, if God wants me to pass, I'll pass. And if he doesn't, I won't. So why should I be worried? And, and she was, you know, astonished and kind of cherished this memory. Um, it's used to a tell this story. or a great excuse, one or the well, other. Or but I passed, you know. <laughs> but uh, there, there was certainly a sense of faith there. And uh, there always has been through my life. There's yeah. always been a, a faith. I mean, people say, well, what do you have faith in? Uh, but it seems to me how you conceptualize what you have faith in is, is in a way is another story, is another challenge. And a lot of time and effort is wasted over humans trying to understand the nature of what transcends. By definition, you're not going to understand it. But certainly the sense of faith has always been a strong factor in my life. And it's something that I, I can recognize in other people across a whole swathe of different creeds so, or beliefs. But then when you say faith, what do you mean by that? Mm, a sense that uh, in some ways it is like that little story, that, that it's not, many things are not down to me. It's like a trust, what it's I would a call trust. a trust, yes. that somehow yeah. life is for yeah. you. And, yeah, yeah, that you yeah. can entrust yourself, that you, you don't have to worry about everything. You're not, um, nothing like as much in control as people think they are or think they'd like to be or worry that they might be, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. it's an entrustment. It's an yeah. ability to entrust I yourself. That. I understand that. Uh, yeah. Which is quite hard to have as a teenager. It can be a very confusing time. Yeah, well, I think my teenage years were quite confusing, as they are for many people. And probably at that stage of life, many people give up on faith and religion and, and, and all that. And I encountered all the same sort of influences that, that lead many young people to do that. 
But because I did have a background of experiences that I found it extremely difficult just to shelve, for, uh, it, it, that didn't really wash for me. I, I couldn't adopt a kind of just materialistic, rational outlook which didn't really go anywhere. Um, it, it, it didn't satisfy, there was something in me that was completely unsatisfied yeah. by, the, by that kind of uh, deconstruction. Uh, I could see that as a, a, an, an interesting, useful intellectual thing to know how to do, but it, it didn't provide a basis for life. Okay. Mm. So, Caroline, you, I know you were telling me earlier you came from a religious family. Your father was a Methodist yes, that's minister. Right. Yes. Um, so you came out of that tradition. Yes. And you found Buddhism a little later than I think than David did. That's right. Yes. Uh, I had. I mean, I actually had quite a few fallow years in which I rejected religion not really because I wanted to go to a more sort of materialist place but more because I I think the sort of distinction between faith and belief is actually something that means a lot to me now because I, I think in my teens I struggled a lot with the religion that I'd grown up with and that was largely over the whole issue of belief, not being able to actually kind of feel the sort of certainty that I felt I ought to be able to feel in order to call myself a Christian. You know, a lot of people at that time were saying sort of, are you saved and do you believe in? And this was a sort of big question. And I didn't feel I could answer yes to any of those questions. So although I was very interested in religion and I questioned a lot and I struggled with the whole issue of faith at that stage, I found the whole thing very depressing and kind of just felt myself to be a bit excluded from it. And so in the end, I just sort of gave up on it and thought, well, I'll just get on with my life and try and do something useful anyway. And, and that's what I did. And, and I think having come back to Buddhism in my 30s and discovered that actually you, you didn't have to sign up to a belief system, you could just get on and do it, it was a great relief to me. So, you know, I think this distinction between belief and faith is actually something that's, that's quite important to me. You know, one doesn't have to believe in order to have faith. In order to have faith, one just has to sort of trust that it's going to be okay and that you can just set out on the path in a way and that the path will find you. And, of course, as soon as I started to do that, what I found was that um, I could look back over that period of time, you know, between my teens and my 30s, you know, 20 years, and during that time I could see all sorts of ways in which the spiritual life had been living in me. You know, I'd actually written my thesis at university on Greek religion. Why was it I was so interested in religion? I'd had lots of dreams about religion. I'd, I'd had three children at that stage, and the, the process of giving birth and so on had been a, a deeply spiritual experience, and yet I hadn't given it that label because, for me, still at that stage, I thought of spirituality and religion as being very closely linked and those as being something about something I had to believe in that I, I didn't feel I could sort of sign up to. So what was the catalyst that you actually, the point you came to where you thought, right, Buddhism is something I actually want to follow and take more seriously? Well, I, I think there were a number of things that took me into Buddhism. I mean, there was a very early experience. When I was in my teens, actually, I was, I was at school and we, we were doing, we were studying world religions in RE and our teacher brought along a Buddhist monk to speak to our class. Which is quite um, unusual in those days. Yes, wasn't it? that's or right. Thought. Yes, yeah. yes, it was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there we were, a horrible class of 15 year olds all sat there. And this little monk was sort of trotted in in front of us. And he, he stood in front of the class and he just stood there and he just started chanting. And you can imagine a class full of 15 year old girls, we, we just couldn't stop giggling. And somebody at the back got the giggles. And then the rest of us all started and we were just like, all over the place. We didn't know what to do with ourselves. We were just so embarrassed. And, like, <laughs> and I was on the front row and I just remember this sort of awful feeling of I'm, I'm going to embarrass myself and laugh here. And there's this poor little man stood up at the front. But he just carried on. And he was just completely calm, peaceful, and just chanted. And gradually this sort of peacefulness came over the class. And we all sort of crept out after the lesson. We were kind of, wow, that was amazing. And so that, that, I think, sort of sowed a seed. But I, I never really thought about Buddhism. I didn't come across it again for years, actually.